This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Missing the magic, expectations were high for Disney to deliver, but there was something not found inside its earnings report. Baked Apple, shares of the world's most valuable company fall deeper into correction territory. What's behind Apple's decline? No 401k, no problem. There are other ways you can save for retirement. All that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Tuesday, August 4th. Good evening, everyone. We begin tonight with news about Disney. The company's stock has traded near all-time highs recently, and expectations for its results were also pretty high. But the Dow component didn't deliver the magic for investors. Earnings of $1.45 a share did beat estimates, but revenue came in at about $13 billion, just below the consensus. Shares initially tumbled in after-hours trading on that top-line disappointment. Julia Borston has the one key takeaway from Disney's quarterlies. Disney's record quarter comes on the back of growth in two key divisions. Marvel's hit The Avengers Age of Ultron helped propel the studio's revenue up 13 percent and its operating income up 15 percent. And the studio did not have to take a write down on Tomorrowland's disappointing results. Disney's cable networks also continue to grow on the top and bottom line, led by ESPN, where an increase in subscribers and rate increases helped offset lower advertising revenue. ESPN, along with Disney Channel and ABC Family, helped outweigh broadcast declines. ESPN is certainly in focus this quarter after CEO Bob Iger said on CNBC just a few weeks ago that it's inevitable that Disney will eventually sell ESPN directly to consumers. Back to you. Julia Borston reporting. Well, fellow Dow component and widely owned stock Apple fell deeper today into correction territory. Shares of the blue chip tech company fell another 3 percent today on heavy volume. They're now off almost 13 percent from their highs this year. They've shed about $100 billion in market value since that peak. And if the stock, if the fall in the stock price wasn't bad enough, there are also reports that Apple's Mac computers, long touted as a secure operating system, are now vulnerable to worms and viruses. John Ford has more on Apple's recent rough run. It's been a cruel summer for Apple stock, with shares down 13% from where they traded just a couple of weeks ago. If you're looking for a single headline to explain the drop, though, you'll be looking for a while. Apple shares have been falling since the company's earnings report, partly on concerns that the iPhone's growth might slow. As I talk to investors, I think the biggest concern is the calendar Q4, the December quarter comp. I mean, look, the company had an enormous iPhone shipment quarter in that quarter a year ago. And I think there are questions and concerns as to whether they can really beat that. We think they can. Uh, and as a result, uh, combined with other factors, we like the stock here on this weakness. So we would be buyers. Another reason? China. As stocks in the country have sold off in recent weeks, investors have worried about what that might signal about overall economic growth. And since Apple CEO Tim Cook has called out China as the company's biggest growth market, that matters. And finally, the stock is at the point where it's falling because it's fallen. Apple's trading below its 200-day moving average, a key technical level that traders sometimes read as a sign that momentum has turned against a stock. It won't be long, though, until we get more news from Apple. The company typically unveils and begins selling new iPhones in September. That's sure to get investors to take another look at the stock for better or for worse. For Nightly Business Report, I'm John Fort. Apple shares weighed on the major averages, which ended lower for a third straight session. Concerns about rising interest rates also pressuring stocks. By the closing bell, the Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped 47 points to 17,550. The Nasdaq fell 9. The S&P 500 was off 4. And oil prices rebounded just slightly following yesterday's slide, settling up 57 cents to 45.74 a barrel. Well, so new orders for factory goods rebounded in June. Strong demand for transportation equipment helped the struggling manufacturing sector, which has gotten stung by a weak dollar, by, excuse me, by a strong dollar, weak overseas demand and spending cuts in the energy industry. The Commerce Department reported a 1.8 percent rise in factory orders following a decline in May. As a result of the report, Barclays says overall economic growth for the second quarter now tracking at 2.9 percent. 
Overall, the economy looks strong enough to support a possible September interest rate hike, so says the president of the Atlanta Federal Reserve. Dennis Lockhart told The Wall Street Journal that only a, quote, significant deterioration, end quote, in economic momentum could convince him to wait longer. Lockhart is one of the first officials to speak publicly since the central bank's policy meeting last week. A hostile bid in the drug sector, but late today, Baxalta rejected an unsolicited $30 billion offer from Ireland-based Shire. Now, if the deal were to happen, it would create a leading biotech company focused on rare diseases. The uh, bid, uh, or word of it, sent shares of Baxalta soaring and Shire falling. Look at those numbers. Bertha Coombs has more on the drama in the drug sector. Baxalta has only been public for a month, but what a month it's been. The biosciences company, which makes hematology and immunology drugs, was spun off from Baxter International. During Baxalta's first earnings call as an independent company last week, CEO Ludwig Hansen said the firm was open to acquisitions as an acquirer. With respect to M&A, we, we are hungry for M&A, but we, we are not uh, desperate. I think... Uh, we will, will use the discipline, making sure that the strategy is aligned, uh, the financials are there, as well as that we can integrate uh, the organization. But it looks like Bexalta may now be the target, not the buyer. Shire Pharmaceuticals made an offer for the company, which Bexalta spurned last week. So today, Shire is going public with its hostile $30 billion bid in what has been a busy year for healthcare mergers and acquisitions. 2014 was a record year. Uh, that year saw $270 billion in announced deals. This year, we have already eclipsed that. With today's announcements, with the unsolicited bid by Shire, uh, we saw uh, about $330 billion and announced transactions. For Ireland-based Shire, it's an about face. It had agreed to be acquired by U.S.-based AbbVie last year, but the so-called inversion deal fell apart after the U.S. changed the rules on American companies acquiring foreign firms to secure tax savings. Now Shire says its deal for Baxalta would give the combined company a strong profile in rare disease drugs and benefits on the tax front. S&P's Rich Peterson says this year has already seen nearly $100 billion in deals with U.S. firms selling to foreign acquirers. Some of these foreign companies were one-time U.S. domicile companies, whereupon they reincorporated abroad to take advantage of lower tax rates. Baxalta rejected Shire's bid, saying it would be severely disruptive at such an early stage as a public company. And analysts say it can afford to hold off. Baxter International still has a 20% stake in the firm, and the rules prohibit any other investors from gaining more than a 10% stake, making a hostile takeover very difficult. Bertha Coombs, Nightly Business Report, New York. Aetna raises its profit guidance and reported better-than-expected earnings for the second quarter. The health insurer said it benefited from strength in its Medicare and Medicaid business, and the CEO is optimistic about its announced deal to acquire Humana. The only overlap we have with uh, Humana is in a few markets on Medicare. We do very well on exchanges. They're having some troubles there. We have a large commercial business. They have very little commercial business. They carry the lion's share of Medicare. So the overlap for us is very strong from the standpoint of complementary products and services. The stock finished the day up 1%. CVS Health issued a soft earnings outlook for its current quarter. The company's drugstore business was hit by a fall in customer traffic and a large drop in sales after last year's decision to stop selling tobacco products. But CVS did see a rise in prescription sales, in part because of pricey specialty drugs. That wasn't enough, though, to prop up the stock, which fell today more than 2%. The Food and Drug Administration has approved the first-ever 3D printed prescription pill. The drug will be used to treat certain types of seizures in epilepsy patients. The manufacturer, Apricia Pharmaceuticals, says that the printer is used to build the pill by spreading layers of the drug on top of one another until the right dosage is reached. Still ahead, are big corporations trying to delay the push for bigger overtime pay? A former labor secretary says yes. We'll debate it.
Freddie Mac is spending is sending rather nearly four billion dollars to the Treasury Department. This after the mortgage finance company posted a sharp increase in second quarter profits. The results mark the government controlled company's 15th straight profitable quarter. During the quarter, Freddie Mac increased its purchases of home loans and sold off greater volumes of riskier mortgages. General Motors will spend more than $800 million to upgrade a truck plant in Flint, Michigan. The investment comes amid solid demand for its full-size pickup trucks and is part of the automaker's $5.5 billion investment program. The overhaul will make assembly line improvements, but it won't result in new jobs. But one area that is seeing an increase in manufacturing jobs is the southeastern portion of the country, thanks in part to the rapid expansion of the auto and aerospace industries. Phil LeBeau reports from South Carolina, a state that's leading the way in manufacturing job growth. From Boeing's assembly line outside of Charleston to the Michelin tire plant near Columbia, South Carolina has become a hub for manufacturing. Nationally, 12 percent of the GDP of our country is manufacturing. In South Carolina, it's now up to 18 percent. So something really, really special is happening. What's happening is the result of an intense push by South Carolina leaders to attract aerospace and auto manufacturing jobs, helping push down the state's unemployment rate. Recently, Volvo picked South Carolina over Mexico for a new assembly plant that will employ 2,000 people. Governor Nikki Haley says convincing companies not to build south of the border means offering them a better option. The way we can step up is certainly costs you can only go so far, but we can step up on our training with our workforce and we can step up with the business environment and how we proceed going forward. A big reason why Made in South Carolina has become so popular is because manufacturers like BMW can ship their products around the world. In fact, the Port of Charleston has now become one of the busiest on the East Coast. The infrastructure is, is really, really good, and particularly our emphasis on ports, because we bring in a lot of raw material, specifically natural rubber from Southeast Asia, and we export a lot, particularly in, in this large earth mover tire plant where we export 50% of what we make through the ports. Made in South Carolina, the new face of manufacturing in America. Phil LeBeau, Nightly Business Report, Charleston, South Carolina. The high-end retailer Neiman Marcus has filed for an initial public offering. The firm, which also operates Bergdorf Goodman stores, filed for an offering of up to $100 million. But that amount is a placeholder and likely to change. This would be the company's return to the public marketplace after being taken private in 2005. Coach beats estimates, but there's more to the report than meets the eye, and that is where we begin tonight's market focus. The handbag company was helped by the acquisition of the luxury shoe brand Stuart Weitzman. Still, this is the eighth straight quarter of falling sales for the company's purses and accessories. Shares of Coach ended the day at $31.41. That was a gain of 3%. Meanwhile, Beezer Homes posted earnings that topped estimates, but revenue did miss forecasts. The home builder saw new orders and closings rise in its most recent quarter. Still, shares tumbled 6 percent to 17.93. Time Incorporated, the publisher of Sports Illustrated Time and People, swung to a profit in its latest quarter as lower costs offset a decline in revenue. The results came despite weaker print ad sales and negative currency impacts. Shares there up 2 percent, 2.5 percent, I should say, to 22.43. Zillow saw its shares zoom higher after hours after posting bottom line results that were better than expected. The online real estate company's revenue also grew and topped forecasts. Shares rose initially in after hours trading. The stock was off 3 percent during the regular session to 74.20. And video game company Activision Blizzard hiked its second quarter outlook for the second quarter in a row. That came on the heels of a 15 percent increase in revenue, helped by digital growth and more expansion in China. Shares initially surged in after hours trading, but before the close, the shares were up just slightly to 25.67. Dow Component Traveler is announcing some executive changes late today. Alan Schnitzer will succeed the current CEO, Jay Fishman, starting in December 1st, and he will join the board of directors as well. Shares were little changed in initial after-hours trading. During regular trading, the stock was off a fraction to 106.63. Well, it's no shock that Americans' incomes have grown at a glacial pace for decades. In real after-inflation-adjusted terms, they pack about the same purchasing power as in 1979. 
In June, the White House announced plans to expand by nearly 5 million people the number of salaried workers <clears throat> eligible to receive overtime pay. The proposal would make salaried workers earning less than about $50,000 a year eligible for that extra pay, and that move is a controversial one. Former Labor Secretary Robert Reich recently wrote an open letter urging companies not to delay these pay raises. Mr. Reich served under President Clinton and is currently an economics professor at the University of California at Berkeley. He joins us now along with Jerry Howard, the CEO of the National Association of Home Builders, which opposes the raise in overtime, the overtime threshold. Gentlemen, welcome to you both. Uh, Thank you. Let me begin with you, Jerry, if I might. This overtime threshold has been raised once, as I understand it, since 1975, and the president's plan to raise it to about $50,400 would take it, according to my research, back in inflation-adjusted terms to the level that obtained in 1975. Do you oppose any increase in that overtime threshold or just one as large as this one? Well, the administration didn't ask us if we opposed any. They just imposed over a 100 percent increase in one fell swoop. Well, I'm asking you. That's a you. problem for I'm small businesses. You, sir. I'm asking you, do you oppose any increase? No, I don't think we would oppose any increase if we're reasonable. You just think this one is too big? It's very unreasonable. Moreover, it applies to small businesses that are just coming out of a depression. And as people are just starting to make money, you talked about uh, incomes being frozen. In the home building sector, they haven't been frozen. They've been going down. And you're really putting the brakes on a very fragile home building recovery. What about that, Secretary Reich? Um, there are a lot of small businesses that are struggling just to, you know, come out of uh, an economic slump that was quite severe. There are other businesses that are not hiring. Is this the right time to put this size of an increase in place? Might well, it be better to, to phase it in? Yeah, th this is not an increase in wages overall. This isn't uh, even an increase in the minimum wage. This is an increase uh, in overtime pay, the percentage of workers that are qualified for overtime. Uh, if an employer doesn't want to offer overtime, the employer doesn't have to. Uh, the employer can simply uh, hire additional workers for 40 hours a week without any overtime. Uh, the point is that if we have an overtime rule, and we've had it on the books in America since 1938, a 40-hour working week with time and a half for overtime, uh, we should at least have an overtime rule that matches, at the very least, uh, what we had in 1975. You're not suggesting, Mr. Reich, that this uh, would not increase the employment costs one way or another for many businesses, uh, are you? Uh, it could increase employment costs if, if a business wanted to keep people on overtime uh, and not hire additional people for under 40 hours a week. But all I'm saying is that a, a business that really feels that it doesn't want to pay overtime uh, has an option, and that option is to bring on more workers and have them work 40 hours a week and not have anybody work for overtime. What about that, Mr. Howard? I mean, that sounds reasonable. It's not an increase in the minimum wage. It's not an increase in overall wages, but it seems I, as though... I, I, I completely disagree with the secretary. Right now, there is a shortage of labor in the home building sector. We're having trouble finding people to come in and work 40 hours a week. And for him to suggest that we could just hire more people, that's going to add to the cost. It's going to add to housing. The, labor, the workers just aren't there right now. Mr. Reich? But, uh, but if there's a shortage of labor, one of the things in the economy that an employer does is a, uh, an employer offers more wages in order to attract more workers. That's that's economics 101. I mean, uh, what we want in this country, what we want in this country are not only jobs, we want good jobs. And American workers have suffered for years as pay has actually deteriorated for most workers in terms would, of adjusted for inflation. Mr. Howard? I, I would suggest that jobs in the construction sector are good jobs. Also, I would suggest to the, to the secretary that training for a carpenter, uh, HVAC person, even a framing carpenter, takes up to 18 months. It's naive to think that we can just go out there and hire these people. They have to be trained. During the depression in our industry, many, many millions of laborers left the sector. They just don't magically reappear. And to say that we can go out and hire more people is naive, and it's dangerous if you want a strong economic recovery in the housing sector. All right, gentlemen, we have to leave it there. Uh, thank you very much, both of you, for joining us tonight. I'm sure the debate will continue. Robert Wright with the University Thanks of California and Jerry Howard with the National Thank Association you. of Home Builders. Thank you. Coming up, don't have a 401k? Don't worry. There are other ways to build a nest egg, and we will show you how coming up.
And here's a look at what to watch for tomorrow. The ADP report will offer a read on the health of private employment. Also on the data front, international trade, an important economic indicator, and weekly mortgage applications figures are out. And that is what to watch for on Wednesday. And baby boomers have too much risk in their retirement portfolio, so says a recent study by Fidelity, which found that many older 401k account holders, like me, uh, had higher allocations <laughs> to equity than is recommended for their age. So there. Part of the reason is that many don't regularly rebalance their portfolio. But what if you're one of the 77 million U.S. workers who don't even have a 401k or an employer-sponsored retirement plan? Fear not. There are other ways to build that nest egg. And Sharon Epperson is here to show you how to do it. So what do you need to do to secure your retirement income if you don't have that, that pension plan, the 401k. And that's almost half of workers today. So there are other ways to save that you should know about and take advantage of. And starting with an IRA, an individual retirement account is the best place to start saving. You can save up to $5,500 this year in a traditional or a Roth IRA. And the IRA, yes, it does not allow you to save as much as a 401k, which this year can save up to $18,000. But it's a place to start, and you still get some of the tax advantages that you would get with a traditional 401k or, tra or a Roth 401k in that you can either have it tax deferred or with a Roth account tax free savings that you're building up. What if I'm self-employed? Well, the great news there is you have even more ways to save and even more ways to save a lot more money. You have choices which most choose between a SEP IRA and a solo 401k. You can save up to 53 thousand dollars in these accounts and what they're really looking you put at that is, in uh, annually you can put that in annually mm -hmm. and that's about 25 percent of your earnings self-employment income that you're able to put away in that SEP IRA the solo 401k is mm -hmm. part 401k and part kind of like a SEP IRA 25 percent of your earnings can go in there and then there may be catch-up contributions if you're 50 or older so you could potentially put in even more money the other thing to think about is a simple IRA not as many people have those today because you can't put in as much money but 12 $12,500. At least it's something. Right right, right, right. What about the, the, there are tax advantages to all of those accounts? Yes, yes. Outside of tax advantaged accounts, what do you and recommend? That's very important to think about if you're a high earner because you really want to think about the number that you need to save, the percentage, which should be 10 to 20 percent of your income. And so you're going to have a taxable account and you won't get the tax savings, but you want the nest egg. So the important thing is to think about your risk tolerance, think about the things that that fidelity study said that are important in terms of growth. Not so much, you know, having all your money in equities, but having a diversified portfolio and mm -hmm. a taxable. But account. fund the t the tax exempt accounts first Absolutely. to the max. First, first money should definitely go into those tax exempt accounts, tax advantaged accounts. Sharon. Thanks, Sharon. Thank sure, you. my pleasure. Always good to see you. All right, the uh, entrepreneurial spirit was alive and well at the White House today. Startup founders from all walks of life made their way to the nation's capital and took part in the first ever Demo Day, Shark Tank at the White House. Kate Rogers reports from the White House and shows us what innovations were on display. I started Most Wells when I was nine years old and I started because I really like to dress nice and I couldn't find any bow ties that really fit my style and my personality. So I started making my own. Mosiah Bridges has been on Shark Tank and the Steve Harvey Show, but today his hard work was on display for a different audience at the White House. The now 13-year-old is founder of Moe's Bows, a bow tie company based in Memphis, Tennessee. He's part of a group of some 90 entrepreneurs from around the country invited to partake in the White House's first ever demo day. I feel great being here showing the bow ties to my president and spreading my business. Also on hand were sisters Betsy and Emily Nunez to demo their business, Sword and Plow. They grew up in a military family and are now repurposing military surplus into handbags. We've repurposed a total of 30,000 pounds of military surplus, have supported 38 veteran jobs, and we've been donating 10% of our profits back to veteran uh, organizations that support veterans for the past two years. One of the pillars of Demo Day is inclusivity, so the White House kicked off the event today by announcing a slew of initiatives. Among them, commitments from big venture capital firms like Kleiner Perkins and Andreessen Horowitz, as well as from tech giants like Google and Facebook to both hire and invest in more women and underrepresented minorities. President Obama stopped by the event to see what the entrepreneurs had on display. We've got to make sure that everybody's getting a fair shot. The, the next Steve Jobs might be named Stephanie or uh, Esteban. 
They might never set foot in Silicon Valley. We've got to unleash the full potential of every American, uh, not leave more than half the team on the bench. The hope is that no matter who you are or where you're from, the idea of one day becoming your own boss is an attainable dream. For Nightly Business Report in Washington, I'm Kate Rogers. I want Mo to come and teach me how to I tie a bow tie. I think you'd look great in a Mo's bow. I have tried with YouTube and everything. I've got to have him up here. We'll have him Absolutely. on. Absolutely. All right, that's a great story to end Nightly Business Report on for tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. And I'm Tyler Matheson. Thanks for me as well. Have a great evening, everybody, and we'll see you tomorrow.